Assalamu alaikum and good evening. Welcome to another episode of the Classics Show. I am your host, Shabnam Riaz. Today we are going to talk about Alama Muhammad Asad. Alama Muhammad Asad was a writer, a linguist, a journalist, an Islamic scholar, and one of the most influential, most influential European Muslims of the 20th century. Now, to talk about Muhammad Asad, we have with us in the studio, and we are delighted to have Professor Anis Ahmed, who is a social scientist, educationist, teacher, Vice Chancellor President of Rifa International University, amongst many things. Thank you very much for joining Thank us you. here today. Thank you. Now, the personality that we're talking about today, uh, I'm sure for many of, of our viewers it's going to be very enlightening. How many people living in Pakistan identify or understand who Alama Muhammad Asad was? Very frankly, um, it might uh, surprise you, but a person of his stature and his standing is not known to most of Pakistanis, not only that, but I think uh, most of the people of the subcontinent are mm. unaware of uh, his size, his contribution, and his impact. Uh, Muhammad Asad had his uh, given name Leopold Wies mm. by his parents who were Jew. Yes. He was born in Austria mm. in 1900 and uh, got his education in Austria, in Vienna. Mm in Germany and ultimately became um, a freelance reporter uh, for a German newspaper. Right. He traveled extensively, mm. not only in Europe but also in Middle East. Mm. And that's where he was very much uh, keen to learn about Islamic culture and he could see a remarkable difference between his own culture mm. and what Islam created as a result of divine values. Right. Uh, remember, he is uh, uh, maturing at a time when world war is about to take place, mm. when the uh, world is getting divided mm. into very obvious blocks, a time when um, uh, the uh, basic notions on which European thought was constructed mm. were being questioned. Right and uh, rise of liberalism, mm. rise of so-called secular democracy, uh, rise of uh, theories about human psyche by Sigmund Freud and philosophers coming up with the skepticism. Mm. In all that background, mm. uh, with his very keen understanding of science and technology in Europe, as well as literature mm. and language, mm. Uh, he uh, finds uh, in Islamic culture hmm. something new. Right. What was it that appealed to him the most? Well, uh, if you read his uh, autobiography, which is Road to Mecca, hmm. a very interesting book, hmm. which came out in 1960s, hmm. uh, 50s, and uh, was very popular by 60s, uh, I used that to teach a course uh, in religious literature hmm in an American university when I picked up him and Malcolm X okay. uh, autobiography. autobiography. These right, two yes. books were used uh, mm. as bas basic texts. Mm. He talks in that about his uh, nature which, which shows us a very unresting soul. Mm. He's always trying to explore. Mm. He cannot live in one single place. Right. He keeps on moving mm. till he finds solace of his soul in a faith which he thought was answer for everything. Right. And that's where he found that uh, in the very simple deserts of Arabia. Where he lived with the Bedouins. With well. Bedouins. Yes. Where he found that in Turkey, mm. in Jordan, in uh, Egypt, mm. uh, people mm. uh, were not uh, that much... Uh, uh, that much uh, formal, but very informal. Hmm. Uh, this informality of people, right. the very word, mm -hmm. whenever he met someone from Islamic background, mm -hmm. what he was told was, Ahlan wa Sahlan. Mm -hmm. 
which means you are belong to my family, you are in my home, mm. you are most welcome. So, you know, this concept of belonging and the soul's quest, yearning to be in a certain place, this, this is all coming together as well because if you see many people are on this quest, they're on this search, they're on this journey, they actually don't know what they're looking for but when they know that this is the place I was meant to be, it's like the last jigsaw puzzle fitting in, the last piece fitting into that jigsaw puzzle. You're right, so long a human being is involved in quest, there is always an answer. Right. You will find that um, those who are on drugs, mm. they also have a quest. They want to forget their existence by drugs. True. They grope in the dark for something they never know. Mm. And ultimately, one day, mm. they find solace, perhaps sometime in uh, a community, mm where people are living a simple spiritual life. Mm. That's why you find some of the pop singers ultimately ended up into uh, du'at or preachers of Islam. So true. Uh, Cat Stevens. Uh, uh, Cat Stevens, uh, Yusuf Islam, mm. one example. Mm. In our own country, several persons, I will not name all of them, mm. who were mod, who were thinking that the ultimate solution is in losing your own existence through drugs and music, they true. discovered. And this quest led them mm. to something true. Mm. Truth always Prevents. wins and prevails. Absolutely. Asad makes a very interesting statement mm. uh, in his uh, autobiography. He says, uh, um, I was robbed by Islam. Ah, that's a beautiful expression. It's a very interesting statement, robbed by Islam which means that he was not just uh, searching for Islam, mm. but Islam searched him and found him. Fantastic. And therefore, uh, uh, if, if, if we can say that perhaps uh, uh, Asad was a European gift to Islam, it will be very appropriate. Mm. Europeans have done a lot. Mm. And uh, if, if uh, perhaps you don't know or you may know about him, uh, he edited a journal mm. from uh, Hyderabad when mm. uh, the country was not uh, independent. Okay. It was under British rule, mm -hmm. uh, which was known as Islamic culture. Mm. But before him, the one who edited was also a convert. Okay. And his name was Marmaduke Pikthal. Again, Pikthal famous translator. Pikthal was the uh, editor of mm. Islamic culture mm. and Asad took over from him. Mm. Islamic culture. Yeah. So not one, but Europe has given many gifts to Islam. Amazing. And each one of them have proven something new. You see, the, 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 the question you raised, mm. I feel very much um, embarrassed, mm. sad, mm. and uncomfortable mm -hmm. when I find that not a single textbook written on the Pakistan movement mm. by Pakistanis or by others mm. ever mention his name. Even though he was such an essential part. He was a person involved mm. in Pakistan movement. In the, con in the constitution as well. He was a person who was appointed by qaid e azam mm. as first director general mm. of Bureau of Islamic Reconstruction mm. in Lahore. Mm. And I asked this question to a bunch of diplomats in their academy when I was giving a lecture. Right. Uh, can you tell me who was your first ambassador in United Nations? They looked around, mm. only one person raised his finger mm. out of them. Mm. He was our first ambassador in UN. Mm. That means his color, his origin, mm. his being an Austrian Jew by family mm. never made difference. Mm. He was a Pakistani. Mm. And that shows us the real image of Pakistan. Mm. Pakistan is not for those who are born there. Exactly. Not for those who carry an imprint of being Pashtun, mm. Punjabi, Sindhi, Balochi, Azad, Kashmiri or whatever you call them. Mm. But uh, Pakistan stands for something different. Mm. And he carried our passport. Mm. He called himself mm. belonging to this nation. Yes. Which means we are not a nation in terms of territory, mm. in terms of language, mm. in terms of ethnicity. Mm 
in terms of uh, our uh, bodily features mm. that uh, northern people are tall and mm. fair and mm, in the south they mm. are a bit uh, dark and so on and so forth so you call them this is the so culture this is so culture mm. but our culture what we call pakistan mm. is something different mm. which has never been touched by our so called tv anchor persons resource True. persons True. showbiz people yeah. our textbooks it's great injustice mm. you know he uh, uh, javed akbal mm. writes that uh, my father uh, had consultation with a german scholar mm. who pointed out a map mm. and showed my father mm. this is the map of future country mm. in that map he showed afghanistan mm. Uh, north uh, west frontier at that time balochistan punjab hmm. kashmir all these were shown to his father allama iqbal by this person no one ever talks about it in any textbook it's true and if i share with you hmm. something Please. which is um, an eye opener hmm. uh, you know he wrote uh, uh, about uh, pakistan hmm. uh, an article and that goes back to 1947 when he was the director of uh, our bureau of reconstruction mm. in this article uh, he says let me put my glasses mm. on he says some of you will perhaps at this juncture be moved to protest against my assertion Hmm. and will point to the great enthusiasm which the people with which the pakistan idea has created among the muslims of this subcontinent you will say and ha- rightly so that the muslims of india have at least awakened from their political torpor and have achieved a greater unanimity of purpose than ever before hmm. that they have become fully conscious of having a separate culture identity based on their being muslims that the foremost slogan of the pakistan movement is la ilaha illallah and they are imbued with the desire to establish political forms in which the muslim world view muslim ethics and muslim social concepts could find their full expression and you will ask me in a somewhat aggrieved voice whether i count all this for nothing from the islamic point of view hmm. which means that what he is saying in 1947 hmm. that pakistan was inspired motivated by the slogan of la ilaha illallah hmm. and repeatedly the question which was raised was leadership of muslim league at that point hmm. was apparent not very really serious about it hmm. because it consisted of whom landlords hmm. persons who had their own interest in leadership right except a few mm. but this person was directing quote of qaid azam with iqbal mm. he lived with iqbal and iqbal asked him to move to lahore mm. and then he moved to lahore from hyderabad mm. from india mm. and he stayed there till iqbal passed away mm. and iqbal had lots of expectations expectations from him, from him the, mm. the 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 writings of iqbal and their letters which they exchange indicate mm. very clearly mm. that iqbal quite often said mm. that asad is a beacon of uh, islam and he will be able to provide a true image mm. to uh, our people mm. so uh, the uh the again you see uh, he he again uh, points out a very interesting thing mm. uh he says that uh, but ask yourselves are all leaders of pakistan movement uh, intelligentsia which forms it uh, spearhead quite serious in their avowals that islam and nothing but islam provides the ultimate inspiration of their struggle are they really aware of what Im- implies when they say the objective of pakistan is la ilaha illallah do we all mean the same when we talk the dream of pakistan mm. now this dream of pakistan mm. to be an islamic state mm. was the basis of its creation as said by this scholar who was part of the movement right unfortunately you find our textbooks telling us mm. it was an afterthought 
it was a slogan raised by some ulama hmm. and making compromise hmm. the those who were ruling accepted some aspects of islam hmm. for the country hmm. to the extent that some words are put in the mouth of qaid azam hmm. in his so called 11th of august speech which he never said and they come forward and say that the vision of the qaid was perhaps to have a so called secular state hmm. here is the person who was directly involved in pakistan movement hmm. who was made director who was brought in foreign office and then made first ambassador of pakistan with a high position mm. to represent the country mm. and throughout his writings on pakistan he mm. tells us that this country was created for nothing else mm. but to have islamic social justice mm. islamic tolerance mm. islamic love mm. islamic pluralism mm. if you look into the matter you will find that among world religions hmm. islam is the only faith hmm. where the text of islamic faith quran hmm. says lakum dinukum waliyadin for you your religion for us our way of life hmm. that exactly. means plurality of faith hmm. tell me hmm. where in any text of religious nature the bhagavad gita upanishads avistas and the lects of the buddhist bible and old testament hmm. you find mention of some other faith hmm. room for other faith hmm. it is the quran hmm. which says if it was not for allah subhanahu wa taala to change one people by the other hmm. through jihad hmm. that the churches hmm. temples synagogues hmm. and mosques where name of allah is often raised would have been demolished hmm. which means that islam is to keep these places of worship active exactly dynamic exactly not to hmm. erase them hmm. not to demolish them hmm. not to destroy them hmm. now if the quran uses these four words hmm. i want to know and i'm a student of world religions mm. where in any sacred text mm. you will find mention of place of worship of the others that's a true does old testament talk Absolutely. about mm. place of worship mm. of the earlier people than the jewish people mm. does the text of indians mm. talk about place of worship of jews and christians does it Very talk true. about muslims mm. the only faith in the world mm. that provides a room for hmm. plurality and tolerance exactly. is islam and exactly you know in terms of just you know as you're saying the word tolerance we you know we try on individual levels to promote this word we try to get the message across what is being lost why is this becoming a word that is so hard to be managed at the moment what's going wrong I think uh, forgive me for my very crude examples but uh, if my 3 year old granddaughter mm. or a grandson is watching for 6 hours mm. how humpty dumpty were broken down mm. and could not be reassembled mm. if he is watching for 6 hours how then is the menace Mm. creates all kinds of troubles mm. and jealousies mm. and hatred mm. and nasty behavior mm. do you expect from this child when he grows he will ever have respect for humanity love for humanity in a culture where we say that the only solution is technology mm. jack ellel a french philosopher has a whole book on that and he talks at and tells us that this culture that we have created techno culture hmm. is completely deprived of hmm. any human values because then we're making robots we, exactly the the, the education is actually moving along the education the we have makes them robots hmm. because what you hear from highly educated phd's in this country and elsewhere is hmm. technology is solution that's hmm. the key hmm. 
Hmm. You find uh, education is just to teach you certain skills, hmm. know-how hmm. and certain uh, capacity building programs. Hmm. But where is ethics? Where is morality? Hmm. Where is humanity? Hmm. Islamic approach to education is very much different. Hmm. It is not a matter of uh, reciting the Quran. It's a matter of building human fiber based on accountability. The fabric of society is knitted on exactly responsibilities, accountability. You are accountable for that. Mm. And if we do not proliferate that at the elementary level, mm. and we say, if we teach our children mm. an ayah of the Quran or a hadith, mm. which says that you should not raise your voice in front of your yes. parents, yes. then we are making them religious, quote unquote. Unless you go the further mile and you actually implement it as well. The, the point here is the moment we talk about the Quran, mm. rings start ringing in the minds of people mm. that here comes religion, which mm. should never come. Mm. While the Quran is not religion in the sense of West, mm. the Quran is a book of mm. ethics and morality. Mm. At every page, what it teaches is mm. that you have to respect human life, mm. respect human honor, mm. respect uh, dignity of people, mm. be fair in your uh, uh, delivery of goods. Mm. Your uh, benchmark mm. of quality mm. has to be observed. And it is a social conduct. It is Ev the, everything. It, it is the working of relationships. And in fact, you know, uh, um, uh, a person is an ambassador of their own religion, their own beliefs. So your own conduct actually defines your religion. It's sure. not about what you're reading, it's not about what you're preaching, it's what you're doing and what you're bringing forth, as you very rightly said, for children as well, to be, you know, to be content with the fact that, okay, you've got them in, an, in a very prestigious school and they're going to academies and, you know, they're getting lots of tuitions, but then again, as you're very rightly pointing out, the nurturing of the soul according to the Islamic values. So another question I wanted to put to you, you mentioned intelligentsia. Now, intelligentsia of any country is, is a backbone, of course. So why do we see them not coming into the limelight? Where are they? Why are they not getting the exposure and the power and the platform that they should be getting? Um, <coughs> Franz Fanon, uh, an Algerian writer who wrote all his works in French <coughs> talks about a phenomena which he calls colonizability. Mm. He says that colonization is not bad, mm. but colonizability is very harmful. Mm. When we are colonized intellectually, mm. spiritually, mm. culturally, socially, then we cannot act otherwise. Mm. Unfortunately, our intelligentsia in this country mm. thinks in terms of that literature which was brought in Europe mm. or America, mm. thinks in terms of society mm. which exists in Paris or London or New York, mm. thinks in terms of entertainment which exists in Las Vegas or somewhere in Tokyo. Mm. Where are we? Mm. Therefore, they cannot see Muhammad Asad. Asad, a European, mm. and he says that the biggest problem for Europe is its bias against Islam. Mm. In one of his interviews with a uh, European uh, um, reporter, mm. <coughs> he's asked, mm. and he says that, I think it is continuation of a crusade from Europe mm. against Islam. Mm. And the reporter jumps at him, what do you mean by crusade? Mm. He says crusade in the sense uh, that although religion has been buried in the West, but deep in their psyche mm. is a fear of Islam. Mm. And that fear of Islam makes them sometimes project Islam as something very horrible mm. and sometimes use all those uh, uh, global uh, strategies mm. which ultimately mm. target Muslims and Muslim countries. Mm. Recently I was reading a book uh, by Vijay Parshad, a uh, 
uh, Indian historian mm -hmm. and uh, he, he, he provides plenty of evidence in the book mm -hmm. and tells us how uh, the European and uh, American stakeholders in globalization uh, tried to create rift between Muslim countries based on sectarianism, mm. Shia Sunni mm. divide, mm. based on ethnicity, mm. the Kurdish and non-Kurdish mm. and all that is focusing essentially mm. on how to protect their interest in energy resource. So why has Islam been politically hijacked? How has it been so easy uh, for those external factors? Very simple fact is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has gifted Muslim lands with enormous natural resources without which mm -hmm. the former colonizer cannot survive. Mm -hmm. We call ourselves living in an age of alternate energy mm -hmm. but with all alternate energy still industry cannot run mm -hmm. without those resources that we have. Mm -hmm. Biggest oil resources biggest mineral resources, biggest coal resources, mm. all exist in our lands. Mm. At the same time, we have biggest human resource, which is a threat. And consequently, our youth mm. were somehow mm. wrongly involved by the West in the name of Islamic Jihad. Yes. To make them extremist, in order to get rid of youth power, for Islam. Mm. And all this is not a conspiracy theory, mm. it's not a guesswork, it's what is evidenced. Mm. You will find even email messages from the heads of institutions of Europe mm. sent to their emissaries mm. that you must involve youth in all these matters mm. and we have all funding available for that. So they have <coughs> at that time understood, I mean, you know, it's ironic that the Muslims had not themselves, but the other people had understood the power of sure, Islam. Sure. And, under, and they recognized the threat that they faced towards it. Tell me very frankly, in this country of ours, do you find our media ever telling us that Pakistan is strong because of nuclear power? Mm. strong because of second largest new resource of energy in the form of coal. Mm. Largest number of youth, 67% youth. Mm. Fourth largest exporter of mm. milk. Mm. Fifth largest exporter of fruit. Mm. Do you find these figures or you only find so and so is killed, kidnapped, yes. Yes. so and so is bugged, so and so is uh, insulted mm. and every time news breaking is based on all those things. Mm. Okay, so then the media has this argument. Their argument is that we are providing what the people want to see. We are giving the audience what they want. Why are they not promoting the soft power of Pakistan? Well, people don't want to be frustrated. They don't want to be uh, depressed by seeing all these things. Of course. It's the wrong argument of media. Mm. People don't want to hear about uh, kidnapping and murder and rapes. Mm. They want to hear something good. Mm. It's only our enemies mm. outside the country mm. who want our media mm. to project mm. a failed state, quote unquote. For last 20 years, mm. our so-called neighbors and friends, allies, mm. have been writing about it. Mm. And I don't believe in that at all. Mm. This country was not created to be a failed state. Absolutely. It is here, inshallah, to stay mm. and be an uh, example for others in mm. development and progress. Mm. We have largest <coughs> resource of youth mm. available mm. to fulfill this demand. Nice. The only thing is, if we have education mm. based on moral and ethical foundations, if we come out of the vicious circle mm. of education for mm. just jobs, mm. education for just techniques and know-hows, mm. if we base our education on Pakistan ideology, yes. our ethics and morality, mm. on the vision of qaid azam to make this country a country where socialists prevail, mm. Islam prevails, mm. then we will be able to provide an imitable example for others. That's absolutely true. <coughs> You're speaking, you're using these words, morality, 
ethics. When we talk about the great people who have contributed, just Pakistan, our region of the world, anywhere, the moral compass, their set of values, their ethics has always been something that has been, you know, talked about and part of and part and parcel of their <coughs> character. So morals and ethics, if, as you said, we are giving our children the their morals and ethics are being, you know, the learning them from gadgets, then what this is something actually that is uh, an endemic. This is something that has to be addressed. Uh, people should be panicked. They should understand and realize that without morals and ethics, a person is just a, a hollow being. So how do we get this message across? Three simple things. Firstly, I believe that we have to address this uh, issue to parents hmm. without home technology or home involvement, hmm. we cannot achieve it. If parents think that early morning hmm. they dress up their children hmm. and drop them in a nursery or a kindergarten or an elementary school hmm. and pick them up at 2 or 4 p.m. Hmm. and then put them at the mercy of the television network, hmm. then parents are no parent at all. True. Agree with you. Parents Agree. have to fulfill their obligations. Secondly, our education where you find that teaching has become a matter of commercial dealing. Yes. You pay a high price mm. and I will provide your child air-conditioned classroom mm. and heated classroom in winter mm. and a diploma and certificate which always carries A's, mm. which is a price for my high tuition. Mm. I think commercialized education must be stopped. Mm. We should have education Mm. accessible to everyone mm. and with high moral standards. Mm. Thirdly, I believe that we must revive mm. book culture. Absolutely. What is happening today is mm. a three-year-old child is not going to listen to a bedtime story from a small book, mm. but he will just snatch the mobile of his mother or his father or elder brother mm. and keep on looking on it for mm. cartoon and all kind of mm. uh, um, uh, western movies mm. where murder and uh, uh, violence mm. is taught. Mm. Which means that we are exposing our youth from very, very early age mm. to a culture which is culture of immediacy mm. and not of learning. Yes. Unless we have book culture, mm. tell me do we have one single institution in this country where they say if a child has read in 100 days 100 small books consisting of hardly 5 pages each, mm. 10 pages each, mm. 20 pages each. Mm. I'm not saying encyclopedia. Mm. I'm saying a very, very small book. Mm. But 100 days, 100 books. Mm. And we will give him a prize in the form of beautiful uh, crystal. Absolutely. Do we have one single mm. exam in the country? Mm. Mm. We don't have. Unless mm. you bring it back. Mm. That book means patience. Mm. That book means effort. Mm. That book means involvement. Mm. That book means ownership. Mm. Who owns social messages? Who owns? Mm. Anonymous. Mm. Anonymity. Mm. They can only create anonymity. Absolutely. If you have anonymity in thinking, mm. anonymous society, mm. no culture, no belonging, no belonging at all. Mm. And that's what we are in. It's a soup in which we are. Mm. And unless we realize that, mm. it's a disaster, mm. not only for us, for the whole of humanity. You mentioned a very important word, patience. With the advent of technology again, and with the advent of instant instant food, Everything instant, instant messages, yes. instant yes, email. Yes. Of course, a person has to keep up with the times, to be functional, to be progressive, but there has to be a balance. Sure. So when we're talking about children as well, you see a lot of impatience and that, you know, that um, sort of uh, virtue of hard work and waiting to bear the fruit of that hard work, that seems, the gap seems to be uh, diminishing and we're getting a deficit there as well. I think that uh, begins with concept of motherhood. Hmm. If a mother hmm. cannot engage hmm. 
her child hmm. and becomes a victim of immediacy, hmm. then child will always be seeking immediacy. When the child comes to mother hmm. and says, I want candy, hmm. I want chocolate, I want ice cream, hmm. what's the response? Mother is watching her own favorite program of cooking. Right. She's not prepared to leave that. Mm. The child keeps on pulling her shirt, mm. starts crying, mm. uh, breaks a glass mm. to, to have her attention. Mm. Ultimately, she stands up and gives him a piece of ice cream or a, or a whatever lollipop, he wants. whatever he wants. Right. What does she create? A patient child? Mm. Or mm. a child who is violent, mm. who creates irritants, mm. who is not prepared to wait for a minute. Mm. Just go to any crosser, cr crossing in Islamabad or Pindi and see, before you have ember light, oh, yes. someone honks. Mm. And as soon as you have green light, they think they must have full acceleration. What does that mean? It indicates our national impatience yes. and it begins at home. Mm. It is there in school, mm. it's there in university, everywhere. it's there in media, in every it's group. everywhere. And unless all these stakeholders work together, mm. media should not provide for quick uh, uh, shots you find. Mm. Music which mm. is erratic mm. is popularized. Mm. You find advertisements mm. which tell you about immediate energy, mm. everything immediate. Mm. That's true. And unless we change, mm. it, it, it calls for a paradigm shift completely mm. at national level, mm. individual level, social level, mm. educational level. Mm. And that can bring the vision of the Qaid, is Islamic social justice. Mm. Islamic mannerism, mm. Islamic democracy in this country. Mm. As you very rightly brought up this point, bringing the child, even the adult, anyone at any age, bringing them back to the relationship with books. Again, that is such a, an important intrinsic part of the patience, uh, the, the, the whole, um, because the habit formation, we don't see, you know, the attention span seem to have diminished as well. Everything's happening very quickly. So at the same time, you have different things, different triggers that are calling for your attention. The importance of yeah. being silent, the importance of just sitting down and actually using your mind in a focus. So many things are going on with the body at that time when a person is sure. reading. It also requires some patience mm. on the part of people who think they have some authority. Mm. Um, for example, in a university, mm. if uh, students have a problem mm. and you think that you are busy in uh, some uh, paperwork in your office and your secretary never allows them to enter your office, mm. they become impatient, they become a mob, mm. they become <coughs> very much uh, um, enraged, uh, annoyed. Mm. But if you have patience mm. and you say, my children, mm. come and sit mm. and welcome them with a smiling face. Mm. Then the message you give them is, of course. you belong to me, I belong to you, mm. we'll solve the problem. It has a domino effect. And immediately it resolves. That's so true. And I'm not just uh, talking theoretical. Mm. I have experienced that in my life. Mm. When I was uh, vice president of Islamic University, quite some time back, mm. uh, there was uh, a student demand that in library there is a book which uh, does not carry good statements about Islam and Prophet peace be upon him. Mm. And they came out in the parking area mm. to make a protest. Mm. I was in my office mm. and just walked out mm. and some admin uh, officer said, sir, you should not go there, the students are there. I said, if, if I don't go there, who will go there? Mm. I'm their teacher. Mm. If they don't respect me, I should resign from here. I walked. Mm. I talked with them. Mm. In five minutes, they were back in their classes. Mm. We removed the book. Problem was resolved. I think it's the power, ethical power mm. of the teacher, which True. must prevail mm. 
yes. and physical power mm. must be subordinated mm. by our ethical force mm. and if we have ethical force uh, transferred to our coming generations mm. we have bright future mm. that's absolutely true and um, coming back to uh, Muhammad Asad then he after um, that publication he spent 17 years on uh, writing uh, the message of the Quran and that was received well he was able to learn Arabic mm. right from the environment mm. and then when he read the Quran mm. he could not keep himself away mm -hmm. but to transfer it mm. to others he was not transferring it to his mother tongue German mm. but in English mm. that means that his grip and knowledge of Arabic mm. and a so-called foreign language mm. was such mm. and vision was such mm. that he felt since English is going to be language of commerce mm. it's in 1920s that mm. he is uh, visualizing it mm. therefore instead of translating in German mm. he translates that into English mm. and English which is very simple Mm. Then he takes up the project of translating the prophetic hadith Sahih al-Bukhari mm. and was able to complete it but only uh, one part of fifth volume could survive because uh, he was imprisoned by British and during that period a flood came in that flood his books in Lahore were all destroyed mm. so he could not again do the whole thing. Mm. Then his famous book is Islam at the Crossroads mm. and there he talks about beauty of Islam. Mm. He talks about how uh, Islam is a gift for humanity and since he came from Europe mm. he could very well understand how to present this to people of Europe in their own language. That's absolutely, absolutely and that was the key part of his efforts that he could understand what the audience would be more receptive to and what, what would touch them, uh, them the most. He also uh, dedicated it to the people who think. Sure. Which sure. is very, very important, sure. isn't it? Sure, sure. Unfortunately, our education blocks all channels of thinking. Again. It tells our children to memorize. Again, yes. Or become slave to their hand mobile. True. Now they cannot count. Hmm. You go to China even today, they have those beads on which they count hmm. physically. But if you ask anyone hmm. uh, to make a simple uh, adding and uh, uh, reducing some numbers, hmm. they cannot do without a uh, calculator. Hmm. So we have made our coming generations subservient to high tech. True without giving the them time to think. The capacity to think is so important, critical thinking, so many things. Sure. Um, unfortunately, we've run out of time, <laughs> but Professor Anis Ahmed, thank you so thank much you. for joining us here today. We spoke about Alama Muhammad Asad, but the conversation, we were able to link, you know, so many universal things and phenomena with this great personality. Thank you so much thank for you, being part of the show Welcome. Today. Okay, so that brings us to the end of today's program. We hope you've enjoyed watching it as much as we did in our conversation. Until next week, bye-bye.